Oh, Korea was even long time ago, Israel of recent. Why? Because both teachers and people who are getting infected. And imagine it. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, uh, good afternoon, and let me welcome you all to the national briefing for Monday, the 8th of June, 2020. This briefing is significant because Nigeria on Saturday, 6 June 2020 reached the milestone of 100 days since the index case was recorded. You will all recall that the index the case was recorded on 27 February 2020. The COVID-19 has taken the entire world by storm because it has disrupted all known systems, including governance, economy, financial system, travels, and healthcare. Even the best of healthcare systems and arrangements succumbed to the force of the virus. Within our national setting, the weaknesses inherent in our national health care systems were made glaring and needed urgent attention. Government determined immediately to take on the lessons and to ensure that the health care system experienced tremendous leap in human and infrastructure development as well as policy focus, stability, and direction. Within the 100 days under review, the following modest accomplishments were recorded. One, the number of laboratories in the COVID-19 network has increased from the bare minimum of two with which the Nigerian Center for Disease Control started with, to 30, with a laboratory in every geopolitical zone in the country providing increased access to testing. Two, over 80,000 tests have been conducted in the country. Over, uh, over 13,000 health workers have been trained, increasing the human resource available for case management, and more personal protective equipment and ventilators have been procured and prepositioned across the country. The number of beds available for isolation and case management has increased from 3,000 beds to about 5,000 beds nationwide. We have developed new guidelines for home care and general case management. And six, we've evacuated over 1,000 Nigerians from different parts of the world while still reviewing the evacuation and quarantine protocols. There has been enhancement in the efficiency of the identification, testing, evacuation, and isolation process for confirmed cases. And nine, we have gradually reopened the economy while balancing between lives and livelihoods. We are working on a mid-term action review in accordance with WHO guidelines, with lessons and recommendations being used to improve the response. We have introduced community engagement and risk communication as critical factors that will help to flatten the curve in a sustainable manner. And 12, We've engaged with development partners and the private sector to grow the capacity of the nation in the response. And finally, we continue to introduce several non-pharmaceutical interventions to slow down the spread of the virus. There are several ongoing infrastructure interventions being made by government development partners and the private sector nationwide. The last 100 days has also brought out the best 
in the spirit of Nigerians. There has been tremendous private sector and corporate mobilization. Similarly, individuals have also sacrificed their little savings for the good of all. What this underscores is the strength of our communal culture and unity in our diversity. The Presidential Task Force thanks everyone for giving hope in the face of a global pandemic, even when humanity seemed helpless. In spite of these accomplishments, Nigeria, like the rest of the world, has witnessed a steady rise in the numbers of infections. As at midnight on Sunday, the 7th June, Nigeria had the following statistics. Confirmed cases were 12,486. Discharged cases, 3,959. And we had a record of fatalities of 354. Based on the trend, science and data as guiding beacons, it has become obvious that Nigeria has entered the community transmission phase. This has significantly helped in identifying the 20 high burden local governments that account for 60% of infections in Nigeria. The Presidential Task Force is already pursuing precision actions on these high burden local governments. It is therefore important for Nigerians to recognize the need to take responsibility and the significant role community ownership and risk communication will play in the future of our national response. Over the last weekend, the ease of restriction on places of worship came into focus. It is important to note that the guidelines give states the latitude and the opportunity to negotiate protocols that meet their peculiarities. We therefore urge our religious leaders and the entire populace to adhere to the guidelines issued by the Presidential Task Force and the protocols agreed by the state governments. The Presidential Task Force will continue to monitor compliance nationwide. The Presidential Task Force wishes to emphasize that a great majority of Nigerians are still susceptible to COVID-19, and if we allow it to transmit easily between us, it may even be more deadly. If everyone diligently observes the guidelines, we can collectively control the spread of the virus and help to protect our health facilities as well as save lives. On 6 June 2020, the Presidential Task Force also visited the National Reference Laboratory to witness firsthand the processes for testing. Experience, as it is, it is said, is the best teacher. We can confirm that the process is rigorous, thorough, and demanding. From the laboratories to the nurses, to our doctors and other medical personnel, an enormous sacrifice is being made by these dedicated Nigerians. Ladies and gentlemen, I have considered it important to reiterate the appreciation of the entire nation to all our frontline workers who toil around the clock to ensure that we remain safe in this country. The visit has revealed the huge responsibilities shouldered by these young and committed professionals, as well as the risk that they face on a daily basis. The visit also enabled the Presidential Task Force to listen to challenges faced at the National Reference Lab and to recognize such challenges as opportunities because they represent motivations for action. The shortage of reagents and supply chain issues are global issues. 
because the entire world is seeking to purchase the same commodities. To the presidential task force, the motivation for action is to look for inward, plan ahead, and develop our domestic capacities. This is because COVID-19 is neither the first, nor will it be the last pandemic. What is certain is that we must not allow the next pandemic to catch us unprepared. The strategic trust of the national response is to test, test and test. However, the visit to the National Reference Laboratory has shown that while we ramp up capacity for testing, we must also enhance the skills and size of manpower to run the laboratories. Moving from two to a network of 30 technology-driven laboratories and coordinating them is certainly not a small feat. It is therefore significant to mention that a major outcome of the 100 days assessment is the recognition of the need for states to scale up responsibility for their public health response in the medium to long term. We hope to build a network of state public health labs that will bring about sustainability in public health response in Nigeria. Since the commencement of our national response, a lot of priority has been given to physical health management of people who are affected. I am pleased to inform you that the Presidential Task Force has commenced the process of integrating comprehensive psychological services program into its activities. This will be for the benefit of people who are in isolation, well-being of their families and the communities. In this regard, we wish to recognize the Federal Medical Center Jabi FCT for spearheading this drive, which shall inevitably assume a national dimension because of the importance of mental health. As we mark the 100 days after the index case, we remember all Nigerians who have passed away from this disease. We commiserate with their families and friends who have had to deal with the difficulty of losing loved ones at this time. We pray that God will continue to console them and heal our land. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, the Presidential Task Force appreciates the World Health Organization, the African Center for Disease Control, the West African Health Organization, the United Nations Family, the European Union, and a host of other partners for the support we have received so far. Finally, I wish to state that in the absence of a vaccine, Nigeria and the rest of the world must depend on public health, social measures, and supportive management of confirmed cases. We urge all Nigerians to take individual and collective responsibility by adhering to public health advice, such as frequent hand hygiene through hand washing or use of alcohol-based sanitizers, use of face masks in public places, and observance of physical or social distancing of at least two meters apart. I now call on the Honorable Minister of Health, the DG Nigerian Center for Disease Control, and the National Coordinator to update you before we take your questions for today. I thank you for listening. Have a good evening. ...of the Federation and Chair of the PTF, Honorable Ministers, Director General, Permanent Secretaries, ladies and gentlemen, 
Saturday, the 6th of June 2020, marked 100 days since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in Nigeria. In that period, we have seen a lot and learned a lot about this novel virus, about which so little was known at the inception and about which not yet all is known at the moment. I used that occasion to give a live update on our nation's response on the Federal Ministry of Health social media platforms. It was an update and a situation analysis. In these 100 days, we have tested over 76,800 persons, recorded 12,486 confirmed COVID-19 cases in 35 states on the Federal Qatar Territory, successfully treated and discharged 3,959 persons, but sadly lost 354 Nigerians, most of whom had underlying illnesses. May their souls rest in peace. We commiserate with their families, and as we do that, we also appreciate our healthcare workers who put their health, their lives on the line and do all they have been taught to do to keep us safe. Our response during this period was focused and targeted at the initial phase on screening travelers at points of entry testing for virus importation, tracing their contacts, and isolating positive cases. It seemed with that we were safe for a while. But since our entry into the community transmission phase, we have begun to see more figures rising and has also caused us to become more aggressive in tracking and testing and increasing our laboratory network capacity from two at the start to 30 molecular laboratories with a plan for at least one laboratory in every state. This way, the turnaround time will be reduced to a minimum and case finding and management will run more smoothly. The management of infected cases is being reviewed regularly and improved with revised clinical guidelines to be published in accordance with learnings and evolving dynamics associated with COVID-19 and global best practices. This includes new discharge protocols, treatment regimen for asymptomatic or symptomatic cases with various clinical manifestations. We continue to collaborate with all states and federal capital territory with regard to their management of cases, with provision of commodities, training, and other technical support where needed. A two-day webinar held on the 3rd and 4th of June on the effect of COVID-19 on health and care management of the elderly was conducted in collaboration with the West African Health Organization, and it took a critical look at various aspects of the impact of the disease on the elderly who are usually at higher risk of infection. The outcome of the webinar provides 
grounds for policy direction for care of the elderly during and beyond COVID-19. The general recommendation still remains that senior citizens being vulnerable should stay home most times and if they have to go out, wear a mask once outside their homes. This morning, the Federal Ministry of Health received the report of the Ministerial Task Team that went to Kano to support the government there in the COVID-19 response with commodities, ambulances, training, technical and confidence building measures. The visit turned out to be a game changer and improved the indices for Kano. It was extended to fact finding missions to offer support to five other states in the northern part of the country where the impact was also very well valued and visible. With the observations and recommendations from the three-week assignment, the committee developed a strategic incident action plan to strengthen coordination capacity of the health workers and improve community engagement in line with our response plan. We know that the healthcare workers in Kano and many parts of the northern areas of our country had become very jittery at the advent of coronavirus disease and had stopped or slowed down attending to other patients, which led to complications in the healthcare delivery. Moreover, many of them had become infected and while over 150 health workers had been infected at the time of the arrival of the team, after they conducted their training on infection prevention and control, there was no report of infections among the healthcare workers who had received the training. This way, their confidence was restored and service was also restored in essential and routine case management and also COVID-19 management. With regard to the unexplained deaths in Kano, which occurred in April over a five-week period, the team confirmed that a total of 979 deaths were actually recorded in eight municipal local government areas in the state. And at a time at a rate of 43 deaths per day, as measured by counting activities at the graveyards. The peak was in the second week of April. And by the end of April, the numbers had start, started to reduce and had finally now settled at 11 deaths per day, which was about what it was before. The verbal autopsy that we spoke of revealed that about 56% of the deaths had occurred at home, while 38 were in the hospital, and with the circumstantial evidence as all to go by, the investigation suggests that 50 to 60% of the deaths may have been triggered by or due to COVID-19 in the face of pre-existing ailments. A significant part was also triggered by inability to access routine care at the time due to the scare of COVID-19. Most of the fatalities were over 65 years old. I wish to thank Dr. Guazo, Professor Nasidi, and members of their team, particularly those who came from Iroa, for diligently carrying out the assignment. 
It is gratifying to note that they all returned safely and had no incident of contracting infection. I must also commend His Excellency, the Governor of Kano State, for the full support he gave to the team to achieve their targets. Finally, I wish to again remind everyone that wearing your face mask at all times in the public or even inside your house when you are not sure of your visitors or your company or if you are in a crowded environment is a very valuable safety precaution for you, your family, and your friends. I also urge everybody, as I do every day, to observe your respiratory hygiene, especially when you are coughing or sneezing. Use a tissue, please, and discard it immediately after. Use sanitizers as often as you can, and observe physical distancing. Thank you all for your attention. I shall now invite uh, the Republic of Nigeria, honorable ministers, gentlemen of the press. Um, good to see you again this uh, evening. Uh, over the weekend, like you know, um, we got to 100 days of uh, this pandemic in Nigeria since the first day, since the first case was confirmed. Not a landmark we want to celebrate, but one that cost us a reason to reflect on the very hard work being done by colleagues across the country, including yourselves, in the work that you're doing. It's been 100 days of resilience, hard work, and sacrifice by many people. And that work, unfortunately, has to continue as we continue to respond to this new um, situ situation. Now, like you know, we're going to have to focus a lot of our response over the next uh, few weeks on the states. And the set of professionals that work in every state that um, have had to take on a lot more responsibility. They're called the state epidemiologists and their teams, state disease surveillance and notification officers, also exist at the local governments, but they're all coordinated at the states. In many states, they're also the incident managers of the emergency operation centers, and they are the heart of our collaboration with the states. So on Friday, we had a, a Zoom conference, as we have these days with many groups, with all of them, to really encourage them in the work they've been doing over, over, over the past three months, and encourage them, and speak with them, understand their challenges, and offer solutions, exchange ideas, and also enable a platform where they exchange ideas with each other. They are the focal people of the public health response in every state. They manage the surveillance, emergency operations, uh, response, and data collection, organizing the labs, reagents, and all of that at the various state levels. So a lot of responsibility on their heads. So really, uh, that meeting on Friday provided us an opportunity to engage, to brainstorm on some of the challenges, and to set new milestones for ourselves in terms of how we are going to improve the work that we're doing with each other. But also, there are a few opportunities coming their way to support the work that we're doing. Uh, we're raising, looking for resources wherever possible to make their life easier. And one thing that we must get out of this outbreak is really to build a network around them. So very often in the past, they have not really been recognized in their responsibility, in the work that they're doing on all our behalfs. But in effect, to do that work effectively, they need the resources. So it is really, they are the first people we call when we hear there's a case of X or why, or there's a cluster of unknown illness or unknown deaths. Our first response is always to call the state epidemiologists. And very often they don't have the resources to go into the rural areas to go and investigate these things. So we're looking for various opportunities, and there are some opportunities in the horizons to support them to be able to do this, their work better. But critically, we've also been advocating to the state governors. Uh, this outbreak has brought their public health teams much closer together with the leadership of every state. 
So now, uh, most state governors now know their state epidemiologists very well. And that relationship will grow over the next few years because we will not return to a country with the health security architecture that we had in the past. We will need to build on what we have learned from this outbreak to design a health security architecture for the future. And this means that we'll need to use technology, use our platforms, and build a lot more uh, closer relationship across the different tiers of government, from the federal at the NCDC level to the state epidemiologists in the teams and the disease surveillance and notification officers in every local government area. And so finally, we're working with the World Bank right now to design some high impact interventions that will get support. And we hope that out, we hope that out of this, we will build an agile, flexible workforce for health security in Nigeria that will be responsive and able to react, use technology, have the best access to diagnostics, and really make sure that we're much better positioned to prevent, detect, and respond. So this group of healthcare workers will become like they are, frontline soldiers in the fight against infectious diseases. But for them to do this, we must equip them with the skills, the knowledge, the equipment, the resources, the physical infrastructure, the vehicles, the motorcycles, the phones, and the resources they need to do the hard work they do on our behalf. So, um, as we get, as we got to the 100 uh, day mark, um, this was, this is really where we focused on our reflection today and um, we're happy to host uh, the chair of the presidential task force at the National Reference Lab and share some of the work being done by the colleagues in that lab. But we also want to focus a little bit on testing altogether. Um, Across the country, we now have reagents to test close to 200,000 uh, samples across every lab in our network. We really need to work with the state epidemiologists over the next week to collect the samples. If you look at the data carefully uh, today, we had the highest number of cases reported from a new state, from Abia State, uh, because they ramped up their testing and they are doing the right thing, because you can only understand the burden of disease that you have if you test more. And by the time you understand the burden of your disease, you are able to uh, plan an appropriate response. So over the weekend, we discussed with the leadership of the health sector in Abia State in terms of how to uh, improve their response, to be able to cater for their new cases, and they're on top of it. And this is really what we're encouraging every state to do. Let's work together, test more people, make sure we understand where we are, and then respond. Thank you very much. Honorable Ministers, um, members of the PT PTF, um, ladies and gentlemen of the press, good evening. Uh, so today the Presidential Task Force met and uh, discussed the proposed um, new protocol for the evacuation of Nigerians. Um, one of the key rules of the PTF is to make sure that we have a multi-sectoral effective partnership between the different agencies of government. Um, I would like to first of all start by thanking those Nigerians that are currently abroad for their patience and understanding while we review the protocol. It's essential that this time around we get it right. It's also important that we make the best use of the public resources available to us so that we have an arrangement that is sustainable and that would allow the more than 4,000 Nigerians that are currently outside the country to come in and uh, join their families. At the same time, the PTF has a responsibility of mitigating risk and ensuring that we do not increase the number of um, cases of COVID we have in country or increase the risk of transmission. And we have looked at the various options available and I'm grateful to the private sector, particularly the Ali Kodangote Foundation for stepping up and um, supporting the testing that will be required for the Nigerians coming in. So we've gone through the protocol today and uh, effectively it has been signed off, but there will be additional uh, work required across the different um, agencies of government to make sure that um, things go smoothly. But strictly speaking, I, I don't see any reason why this cannot uh, proceed as quickly as possible. Um, this is 
just to clarify, this is a joint teamwork with the different agencies of government, um, ranging from uh, Federal Ministry of Health, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the Federal Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, um, the Nigeria Diaspora Commission, Immigration Authorities, Security Agencies, and uh, the Aviation Sector. Um, the key part of the proposal is that there will be a need for Nigerians that are currently outside the country to undergo a PCR test for COVID-19 before they board. These tests need to be valid for at least for 14 days. In other words, um, if the test is done beyond 14 days, then it will not be um, accepted. And prior to boarding, they will be required to um, provide um, an undertaking that they will um, um, that they will follow the necessary uh, precautions that we have um, applied uh, when they come into country. This will include uh, the need uh, for them to make themselves available for a repeat PCR test in country when they arrive within 72 hours. They will be given an appointment card and an address where they will go and have the test done. They would also be required to stay in the points of entry. Uh, this will be Lagos and Abuja for now because these are the two cities where the flights will be coming in and these are the arrangements we've done with the private sector. Uh, they will need to stay in Abuja or Lagos and make arrangements for their own accommodation in these two cities for the period of uh, 14 days. The main difference uh, with what we have been doing in the past is unlike in the past, we will, we will not be responsible for the transportation or the accommodation of Nigerians coming in. Um, they will need to make their own alternative arrangements to stay in Lagos or Abuja, not only for the period of testing, but also for the period of uh, self-isolation. But they can, if they wish, um, stay at home, provided they undergo self-isolation at home. They, they will be tested when they arrive. They would have had a test. It has to be negative before they board the flight. And when they come in within a 72 hour period, they will have a repeat test to make sure that um, they have not um, uh, developed COVID. They will then be followed up through a strict process of uh, supervised isolation where they will be contacted on a regular basis every day and monitored for the presence of uh, symptoms that might require um, them to be um, taken into treatment if they subsequently become positive. These changes will be in line with international practice and the country will actually be doing, be doing a lot more than other countries are doing at the moment. It's important that we get this process uh, to work because we have more than 4,000 Nigerians outside the country. We need to smoothen it. We need to make sure that we can bring up to 1,000 Nigerians per week so that we clear the backlog over the next um, four weeks. Um, in terms of prioritizing, um, again, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs will provide additional detail to the relevant Nigerian missions, but all Nigerians abroad will be required to register themselves with the relevant Nigerian missions. The Nigerian missions will coordinate and provide clearance for the evacuation of Nigerians. For the moment, we are going to place emphasis on people in challenging circumstances abroad, including short-term visitors, those on medical and official trips, those on family holidays, pregnant women, elderly, and the students. Um, once they come in, they will undergo the usual necessary clearance at the airports, and um, their, pass their passports will be retained by immigration authorities. Uh, we will make sure that they follow the usual guidelines we have in terms of physical distancing, uh, the use of face masks, um, etc. And we have already worked with the airport authorities in Lagos and Abuja to make sure adaptations are done to the airports to ensure that um, these policies are followed through. Um, at the, after the testing, they will be allowed to go home and uh, self-isolate. We, uh, we will give them a free traveler's kit, which will contain a digital thermometer, a temperature monitoring form, 
um, alcohol-based hand sanitizers, and information guidelines on self-quarantine and how to do it, um, as well as a pamphlet on COVID-19 and some face masks. They will continue to be contacted by the relevant NCDC um, staff to make sure that this process um, is going according to plan. And again, we will plead to Nigerians to please cooperate with these guidelines, particularly those coming in, but also those that know relatives or friends that have come in from abroad. You are not supposed to join the public, you're not supposed to go out, you're not going to, supposed to go to work, you're supposed to self-isolate at home. And if there is any violation of this, we would be interested in knowing so that we take, take it up with the relevant um, persons. And um, once they complete the 14-day self-isolation, they will be signed off, and then that's it, really. Um, they are free to, people are free to go. Um, we hope that these arrangements that will come into place um, as soon as possible, we are just tidying up a few things. It has been passed by the PTF. We hope that um, all the relevant government agencies will cooperate to make sure that this works. We do have a responsibility to make sure that we make the best use of the limited resources we have and we devote those resources for the purpose of um, the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question um, for the Ministry of Health came from Amaka, I think, and it's about home care. Home care in COVID-19 management is something like the last card. If you have many cases turning up, uh, you have your isolation centers, your treatment centers, your holding uh, centers, and they are full. They start considering other options. Now, we have said many times here that the COVID-19 infection manifests in many ways, that 80%, up to 80%, we have little or no symptoms. They have little or no symptoms. In fact, some of them feel very well. And those are the ones who do not see any reason why they should be in the hospital, why you should be holding them. I think you know the story. You have heard examples of that story. They don't see any reason why you should hold them. So it's quite difficult in some places and other certain circumstances convincing someone who feels very well uh, that uh, he needs to be in isolation. And the reason for that person being in isolation really is to uh, preventing from infecting others. Now, that's the category that you want to put in home management because if, uh, the, if when you cannot uh, accommodate them or the treatment center. So it is not those who are very sick because those who are not sick, who are very sick, we have to be in an institution to be cared for. But the ones who uh, feel well or have very mild symptoms are the ones who uh, will be in uh, home management, in, but before you get to home management, in fact, you have other improvised uh, um, measures that are being introduced by primary healthcare, for example, to use dormitories and uh, uh, other available empty buildings. The other day, we just got offer of some more buildings where we can hold people, I mean, not hold them, but where we can have people stay until they are uh, no more infectious. So the Real hospital beds will be reserved for those who are sick. Now, managing people of that type sometimes is not easy because they can get restless, uh, they want to go to uh, work. So the kind of management you need is not necessarily much of nursing. So we need some psychological management and it's not, you need uh, things uh, to occupy them with. And the human resources you require for that is not so much, it's not so high. You need uh, counselors, you may need, uh, that's why the primary health care comes in very useful. I've mentioned that before, at this very stage, because they're used to community, they're used to work in the communities, and they can provide human resources, community health workers, they have thousands, so who can manage uh, these cases uh, successfully when it comes to that level and they can pay, make the necessary phone calls, they can pay necessary visits and uh, try and keep the people uh, in, in good spirits. Now, the other one about, well, the, that, that, that question is uh, actually to uh, NCDC, but I'll just start it off and he can uh, add to it. The question of the 
cases in Kano, the 50 to 60 uh, percent. Uh, we, you remember we said we are doing a verbal autopsy. Verbal autopsy means that you never really saw the patient, you never saw them. And you are trying to do a circumstantial, and I like to call it circumstantial evidence. For example, we asked the relatives what symptoms did they have. They had cough. Did they have fever? Yes, they had fever. Okay, uh, this person, what, how long did the illness take? If the cough was about six months, nine months, then definitely it was something else. Maybe it was TB or something else. But if the cough was just a few days, and then they had fever, they had sore throat, or whatever it is, then you, you make an assumption, you make what you call an educated guess that it could have been. So that's, that's uh, uh, the kind of, uh, that's what a verbal autopsy gives you. It gives you roughly an estimate. It is not something you can go to the bank with, uh, but it gives you a good guideline of what it could have been. It is likely to have been this. So the uh, rest of the meaning, uh, NCDC can uh, add to it. Now, um, Juliana, a very good question. If the states can partner with each other, that is actually part of what we look at, only that uh, once you, ha you have to have the necessary uh, assets for that, and for that you need ambulances, yet it's true. In fact, we do have plans to be able to move p people from um, who are moderate and whose condition suddenly turns bad to ICU. You move them across, you can move them across, across the state boundary to a facility where you have ICU. If one state, for example, does not have an ICU, you can, can do the uh, movement that way. So that possibility is there. Uh, perhaps the possibility, if you have an overflow, of moving more positive uh, patients uh, from one facility to a neighboring state. You know that Lagos and Ogun State, for example, are almost contiguous, and it did happen that the index case that came into Nigeria was actually in Ogun and was moved to Lagos. So it's not something that has never happened. Uh, it can happen that, yes, one state will support the other, particularly with uh, the nature and quality and the type of care that is required. Uh, I, yeah, I think that sort of answers all the questions for the health sector. Seeing uh, gory pictures of more severe cases. Um, I think that's a good thing, uh, actually. Um, but having said that, you know, we have lost uh, 354 people that we know of. Uh, each individual in this case is someone's brother, wife, father. Uh, some of them I know personally, some we've met in the course of work here. Of course, there are many healthcare workers infected. Um, so really, I think let's not jump to conclusions, but we are happy uh, so far that we haven't seen the level of severity that we have seen in other contexts. Um, we don't wish for that level of severity, but we must not drop our guards. So we must keep working very hard because sometimes these things come in, in phases and really it depends on us, on how hard we work on all these interventions that we're talking about. They're not academic discussion. They really do have an impact. So the, few, the more aggressive we are in preventing transmission, the less likely we are that we'll see those severe cases and deaths. So we must keep pushing at this. You know, on, on Kogi, I really want to not answer too many questions on Kogi because we have to just keep uh, pushing on the right things. Uh, the extra uh, case we announced was uh, referred to a health center in Abuja. We get the, we get the samples. In, at NCDC, sometimes we don't even know where the sample has come from exactly. Our role is to get the sample, do the test, send the results back, uh, do the surveillance, analyze the data, use it to make public health uh, decisions. And no, we haven't received uh, any extra samples to test, but we also don't just test random samples collected. Every sample must be linked to an individual uh, by the time it gets to us. Um, the, the question on uh, our re responsibility at treatment centers. Yes, I did see that uh, tweet circulating. It's unfortunate. Uh, everybody knows 
NCDC doesn't run any treatment center anywhere in the country, not in Lagos, not in FCT, not in any state. Our role is a national public health institute. Our patients are populations. We don't deal with individual patient care, we deal with populations. Uh, that is the mandate of this agency. So in terms of case management, where our responsibility ends is in providing supporting clinical guidelines, the development of clinical guidelines, uh, mentorship and things like that for the different infectious diseases. But we don't manage centers. Uh, but we also know that every state is struggling. And for every negative story, if you look hard, you'll find 10 positive stories. I know for a fact that many states are working very hard to improve the conditions of their treatment centers. Very early, we saw a lot of those stories. Now they're an exception. And that's why when you find one, people recognize it, because most of the stories are actually uh, positive. So I, um, NASA is trying very hard. Maybe one individual had a bad experience. I know that they have seen this, and I know that they will improve, uh, try very hard to improve the care that they, they are providing. Um, the story of 35,000 being paid to Nigerians by NCDC. This morning, I went to, to we attended uh, to the Public Accounts Committee at the House of Representatives. That's where we were this morning. So every naira we spend, <laughs> it's not a, none of our private companies. We will be accountable for it. So never, there will never be a time where money will be given out uh, like that. So I think when people make comments like that, it actually shows some deficit in understanding in how government works. No chief executive or no accounting officer actually has the power to distribute uh, finances unless it's part of a defined uh, program. In terms of contact tracing, there were two questions that are linked. Um, um, the groups, do, how many groups are doing contact tracing? Uh, can we use an app for contact tracing? We're looking at all this. Remember, some states are already doing it. Uh, Lagos has a specific app they're using. Kaduna has an app they're using. Contact tracing is a responsibility of the state government. We support them in doing this, and all the data has to come back into the national uh, surveillance database called SOMAS. So really that's our role in making sure we support their doing this. So the situation is always different in the different states, how they're able to manage this. So this is a state government responsibility, and we support them in many ways, and some are adopting technology to different extents. And yes, apps are good but apps will not finally uh, solve the problem. You still have to identify who the contacts are uh, and have a conversation with them, understand the intensity of that contact in order to defy, decide what public health measure will be carried out on that individual. And the last uh, question was from Mitare Ibeng. Happy I pronounced your name correctly, I hope. Um, I think you asked about uh, the rise in number of cases in Abia. Yes, uh, we were in a way surprised, but also in a way not too surprised. Because we know that the testing numbers in the southeast have been low. And this has been uh, uh, an advocacy point for me. We've reached out to all the states in the southeast. Uh, we know people in the southeast travel a lot. Uh, so there was no reason why there wouldn't be um, more cases there, given uh, the tendency to travel. So from the very beginning, we were always worried about insufficient data uh, coming out from the southeast. Initially, it was thought to be about testing, but we've improved the testing, access to testing capacity now. And um, yeah, so the more we've seen a number of cases being reported from Abia, I think that's a good thing, because the more you identify the cases, you're then able to institute and prioritize the measures you need to prevent further cases. You're able to uh, exclude them from uh, the rest of society, uh, make sure they don't transmit to others. If there are healthcare worker infections, you now prioritize IPC in the hospital. There are many things you then do that you will not do if you're not measuring. So I think. Uh, even this weekend, in speaking to the health leadership in Abia State, I could see a renewed vigor in their, um, you know, they're really committed to 
addressing the issues. So I, this is really what I'm encouraging every state. Listen, this is a virus. Uh, finding the virus in your state doesn't say whether you're a good commissioner for health or a bad commissioner for health. It is a virus, it's an outbreak. The earlier we find it, the better. Nobody is criticizing Lagos for having half of the cases in the country. In fact, Lagos, we praise them for doing well because they have responded effectively. So that is really what we want to encourage every state to do. Uh, the more you find, you can then address the issues and collectively we can get on top of this. Thank you.